coverage of Great Lakes Now. I'm Christy McDonald, and joining us here at the desk is Tim Eater. He is the executive director of the Great Lakes Commission. Tim, how are you? I'm great, Christy. Thank you. This how is a you? wonderful way to kick off Great Lakes Week here in Cleveland. We're really proud to be the first event here for Great Lakes Week. The Great Lakes Commission is is holding its uh, annual meeting. We meet twice a year, and, and this is a great way to kick it off. We're really pleased to have the partnership today at our meeting. For the first time, the International Joint Commission commissioners are actually going to be sitting with the Great Lakes commissioners. So we, again, a joint meeting. For people who are watching across the Great Lakes Basin right now who may not be familiar with the Great Lakes Commission, talk a little bit about what it does and what the goals are. Sure. Well, first and foremost, we represent the Great Lakes states and provinces. We were formed by a compact among the Great Lakes states. They all got together back in the 1950s and said, hey, we all care about the Great Lakes. We want to see the, the Great Lakes protected. We want to see them developed economically in a wise, sustainable way, but we need to work together. And so they formed the Great Lakes Commission. So what we do is we take direction from the states and provinces. We, we do include the, the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. And they give us direction on priorities, issues that they want us to work on, whether it's aquatic invasive species or pollution in Lake Erie uh, or economic development. And we tackle those issues. We have a staff of about 20 based in Ann Arbor. And we bring our commissioners together uh, twice a year here, uh, w once a year in a place in the region, and then once down in Washington every uh, February or March. We take the whole uh, crew down to Washington to take our case to the uh, federal decision makers. I think what's amazing uh, to know is that it's such a collaborative effort between so many different groups in the Great Lakes Basin and also with, with the federal government and the environmental groups as well. What kind of communication do you have with them? We work really closely and I'm very proud of the fact that we do have a lot of institutions in the Great Lakes region, a lot of government agencies and organizations like, like ours. Um, but we do work together, and this Great Lakes Week is the embodiment of, of that collaborative uh, opportunity. The other thing we do is every year we go to Washington, and we work really hard leading up to Washington to, to collaborate on our list of priorities. So when we go to Washington, we don't have six different organizations telling members of Congress that this is what's important to me and this is what's important. You know, we all are singing off one sheet of music, literally one, one sheet of paper that, that expresses our priorities. That's got to make all the difference in the world because it, it would seem that it could be massive red tape if you have competing interests from competing groups. It, it begs the question of the who's in charge. Exactly. So exactly. talk to me a little bit about what you believe are some of the biggest issues that are facing the Great Lakes this year. Well, I'll tell you a couple of things that we're going to be doing at our meeting. Uh, w one of the things, we, we looked at the situation in Lake Erie a year ago, and when we had our meeting in Detroit a year ago, uh, Lake Erie was under siege from al algae blooms, and there were harmful algae blooms, green muck washing up on the shores, and our commissioners said, you know, what can we do about that? So they tasked us with forming a task force made up of our commissioners, resource experts from the states and provinces, to come up with recommendations for reducing phosphorus, which is the nutrient which contributes to those harmful algal blooms. So that task force has been working for a year. They've come up with a number of recommendations to solve those problems. That work will be presented this afternoon, and then tomorrow our commissioners will, will enact a resolution that, that reflects the highlights of that, uh, of that uh, uh, group's work, and we'll go forward to try to get those recommendations implemented. That's that's one of the things we'll be working on. Algae blooms weren't as bad this year on Lake Erie? They weren't. We caught a break. Mm -hmm. It's weather related. Uh, a year ago we had uh, tremendous spring rains, winter and spring uh, runoff, flush the fertilizer off the land into into Maumee Bay and uh, Sandusky Bay where the where the uh, nutrients stimulated algae growth. Uh, this year, you know, we're near drought conditions. We didn't have the, the winter and spring runoff, so we didn't have the pollution washing into the lake. But just because it didn't happen this year, it doesn't mean it's something that should not still be addressed, because in years we've got some weather changes and weather pattern changes that may shift that. We could see that again next year. Yeah, and, you know, Lake Erie and the other places that experience this, they're too valuable to leave up to the vagaries of the weather. We just can't be... Uh, dependent on a good winter or a good spring to, to protect the resource. We need to take action to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that what happened in 2011 isn't repeated. So algae blooms is one thing that will be addressed. Mm -hmm. What are the main concern for the Great Lakes? Um, well, uh, pollution from uh, uh, nutrients and, and, and uh, phosphorus and runoff, uh, invasive species, 
you know, we recently found Asian carp DNA. Haven't found any fish, but they found Asian carp DNA in Lake Erie. Uh, tremendous concern about invasive species, not just Asian carp, but all invasive species. You know, we have 182 different non-native species that have really changed the ecosystem. We've got to shut the door on those invasive species. Another thing that we're really interested in and concerned about is sustaining the progress that we're making. We're, we're living in an unprecedented era right now of federal and state cooperation and federal support to clean up and restore the Great Lakes. We've got the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which has already pumped in over a billion dollars in cleanup and restoration dollars over the last three years. We're in the middle of a five-year program. We, we need to uh, continue that progress. Where's the funding for that this year, out of curiosity? Um, two years uh, so far have, uh, well, actually three years are in the bank, uh, 475 the first year and 300 each the second and third year. Uh, the proposal right now from the president for year four is 300, but the budget has not been enacted by Congress yet. Uh, one congressional committee proposed 250 million, a bit of a cut, uh, but they haven't acted yet, so we don't know where it's going to end up. Yeah, and unfortunately, it seems to be a bit of the the shift. It keeps getting a little less, a little less, a little less. Let's go back to invasive species. Uh, sure. You talked about there are a, a variety of them that you say that we should shut the door on, but let's talk about Asian carp you bet. because that seems to be the poster child for all invasive species. When and and most of all, the the fish I think that people can connect with when they read stories about invasive species. Talk to me about the Great Lakes Commission, the study that you did that you mm -hmm. announced in January about the separation of Lake Michigan from the uh, Mississippi River Basin and in working with the Chicago Area Waterway System. Right. Well, uh, the Chicago Area Waterway uh, was artificially connected to between Lake Michigan and the Illinois, which leads into the Mississippi, back around the turn of the century. Um, Lake Michigan flows into the Mississippi River. It's not supposed to do that. That currently forms a highway. I say it's not supposed to do that. It was done intentionally but it, doesn't, it didn't happen naturally. Um, that forms a highway for invasive species to move from the Mississippi up to, towards Lake Michigan. And there's tremendous concern that the Asian carp are going to move up that highway. There is an electric barrier in place. It does seem to be working, but it was never intended to be a permanent solution. So we undertook a study to determine whether or not it would be possible to physically separate the Lake Michigan side of the waterway from the Mississippi side put in place physical barriers and we released that study in January. We put forward three options that showed not only is it feasible but it can be done without resulting in flooding. It can be done while protecting water quality because we didn't want to dump pollution into Lake Michigan and it can be done while maintaining the movement of commercial goods. Commercial transportation is very important. And so we needed to do it with those three goals in mind, not just to, to block the species. Because that is the criticism, that commerce needs to still move forward, which is why those basins, they were connected, and that it would totally revamp and change the way Chicago deals with their, with their water system. How does the, the Great Lakes Commission study differ from the study that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is doing right now? Well, it differs, differs in a couple of ways. One, the Corps is on a, a slower timetable. They're moving um, uh, at a slower timetable. Is, is that frustrating for you? Yes, it is. It's very frustrating for the Great Lakes states. We want to see action on this. We, we, we don't feel we don't have time to wait. And that's one of the reasons that we undertook our study, was to show that it could be done, show that physical separation could be done, so that the states had an agenda to, sh to, to put in front of the Corps to say, we know this can be done, uh, and also to demonstrate that it that the study could be done relatively quickly. Uh, and we also wanted to inform ourselves as to how much we thought it would cost and who would pay for it and you know what the implications. It's very complicated. It is very complicated and people at home will sit and say, okay, well, tell me how much is this going to cost me to revamp that entire area and to separate yeah. the two. We did cost figures and they're in the neighborhood of $4 billion for the most cost effective alternative. Is there a range? Yeah, it goes up to $9 billion. But like I said, we put forward three options. Two of them had price tags of about $9.5 billion. One of them had a price tag of about 4.2. We didn't express a preference, but why would anybody choose 
to spend $9 billion when you could spend $4 billion. So it's pretty obvious which one is preferred. A lot of conversation this week about invasive species and about Asian carp. That's right. Yeah. It'll be a busy week. Um, we expect to uh, uh, come up with some. We, we're facing a number of resolutions that are on our agenda. One is on nutrients. One is on emergency preparedness and how we prepare for and respond to spills like the Enbridge Energy Pipeline spill that happened in 2010. So we've got another report that we're working on on that. So lots on the agenda. And a lot of time. So Tim Eater, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. The Executive Director of the Great Lakes Commission. Have a wonderful Great Lakes Week. Thank you.